Okay, I think we can start now. Uh, again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night for all of you joining today here through Zoom, but also to those of you who are joining from the webcast. Excellencies, colleagues from the UN organizations, representatives from the civil society and private sector, scientists, students, and dear friends. Welcome to the last day of the Global Symposium on Soil Biodiversity. My name is Natalia Rodriguez Eugenio. I'm a Land and Water Officer and member of the Global Soil Partnership Secretariat of FAO. And I will be moderating this first one hour plenary session on soil biodiversity in the global agenda. I would like to start by wishing everyone a happy International Mother Earth Day. I'm very happy to be here with all of you, and I would like to thank you all for the interest shown in this fundamental topic for soil health, for our health, and in short, essential for our survival and for the care of our Pachamama. We have a very interesting agenda ahead of us, which is the grand finale of a successful symposium. But I want to start by reminding you of two main important points. First, I would like to remind you that today we have simultaneous interpretation in French and Spanish. To find it, please go to the bottom of your Zoom window and look for the small globe icon. If you click on the globe, you will see the languages available. And secondly, remind that the three most voted posters will be announced during the closing ceremony, ceremony of the symposium. So please stay, stay with us until the end. Again, a big congratulations to all the authors who participated in creating these posters and filming their video recording. They are awesome. And now let's get back to today's topic. In this three previous day, we have heard about the latest advances in the detection and identification of soil organisms, about sustainable soil management practices to conserve and restore biodiversity, and how soil biodiversity can help us to improve agri-food systems. To complete the technical sessions of this symposium before the final conclusions, today we have some very distinguished speakers. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you our first speaker. I'm sure you all know him very well. He's a pioneer in the restoration of soil health and with a tireless career promoting the role of soils as key allies in climate change mitigation, food security, and water quality. He is a laureate of the 2019 Glinka World Soil Prize, and last year he was also awarded with the prestigious World Food Prize. Member of the Science Policy Interface of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, join me in welcoming distinguished Professor Radan Lal. Dear Professor Lal, the floor is yours. Thank you. Please help me show my slides. I want to thank um, FAO, uh, Professor Rodriguez. I want to thank UNCCD, Dr. Baron Orr, and colleagues. Um, and I wish you all a very happy. Uh, very joyful the Earth Day. The next slide, please uh, help me with uh, advancing my slides. Thank you so much. Please, uh, soil life nexus is very well known, very well uh, understood. Next, please click. Essentially, all life depends on soil. There can be no life without soil and no soil without life. That is the essence of biodiversity. And the death feeds life. That means rhizosphere, rich of biodiversity, is the only place in the universe where the death is resurrected into life. Next, please. Thank you. Please, next. Um, again, uh, how the world increased anthropogenic activity has decreased biodiversity globally, uh, tremendous decrease between 1970 and 2016. Next one, please. Thank you. Please keep advancing. The Green Revolution, which was a great, next one, which was a great success story between 1961 and 2020. Uh, while the global population increased to about five times, the cereal production went up 3.3 times. Uh, the next, please. Please keep clicking. Please keep clicking. Thank you. Uh, and the per capita 
production increased, which we call the global uh, greenhouse miracle or the Borlaug effect. The next one. Thank you. Please keep uh, clicking. Uh, this was achieved because of the increase in input of uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, pesticides, uh, herbicides, many inputs, irrigation increase. Next one, please continue, please, quickly. Uh, but it also led to degradation of soil, FAO data 33%, absolutely accelerated soil erosion by water. The next one, please keep clicking. Continuously, please keep clicking. Uh, wind salinization, uh, very serious problems. Uh, one third of the land area. The next one, please. We have a concept called peak soil. Why not peak uh, uh, soil, just as the case of peak oil or peak minerals. In fact, uh, the plant, please keep clicking, continuous basis. Uh, suitable agricultural land, about 0.25 hectare. We have in many cases only 0 0.05 hectare, which is creating a lot of political issues and unrest. We have soil refugees. Please keep going. Thank you, please. Uh, keep going, please. Uh, therefore, the peak soil and extinct soil should be also addressed today. In despite of all this, uh, we still have a problem of food insecurity affecting as many as, please keep going. Thank you. Please keep advancing. Almost 700 million people, mostly in Africa and South Asia. Keep going, please. Amen. And the COVID-19 has uh, also brought about a uh, severe increase in uh, disruption of food supply chain. And despite 40% increase use of land area under agriculture, all those inputs, uh, tremendous increase in food production, yet we have one in 11 people undernourished and two to three in seven are malnourished and uh, already increase of 1.1 degrees centigrade in temperature since 1900. And therefore, business as usual is not an option. Next, please. Thank you. Please go next. Regenerative agriculture is an option which is inspired by eco-innovation, powered by non-carbon energy, driven by circular economy and green infrastructure, supported by the recarbonization of the terrestrial biosphere. The terrestrial biosphere may have lost as much as 460 to 500 gigaton of the carbon. Therefore, restoration of the recarbonization, increasing the carbon stock in soil and vegetation is probably a very important option to consider. Next one, please. Which has also a strong impact on uh, food security. Therefore, the green revolution of the 21st century uh, has to be soil-based. It has to be ecosystem-based. Next one and it has to be knowledge-based. And that's a difference, rather than focusing, which are varieties are very important, fertilizers are important, irrigation is important, but we can't ignore soil health. We can't ignore ecosystem integrity. And that's the point why biodiversity is important. Please next one. The idea is, some people say, produce enough from less, more from less, a matter of semantics, the idea is less land, less water, less fertilizer. Please keep going. Less chemicals, less energy, less greenhouse emission, so that we can save resources for nature, biodiversity, nature, biodiversity together. Therefore, we should be thinking about carbon-based fertilization. It's not a question of NPK, but CNPK, C carbon, if that comes before NPK, the soil biodiversity will improve, soil health will improve. The next one, please, ma'am. Next one. Thank you. Please going. Keep going. Technical potential of carbon sequestration soil is about two and a half gigaton of carbon per year. Two and a half. While the fossil fuel emission and land use emission together are about 11 gigaton. Therefore, even under the best case scenario, soil carbon sequestration can mitigate, offset, reduce 25% maximum. Therefore, finding non-carbon fuel sources 
is very critical. Between 2020 and 2100, the technical potential of carbon sequestration is about 333 parts per million uh, petagram, which is translated to 157 parts per million, which is effective strategy if and only if the fossil fuel emissions are reduced and non-carbon fuel sources are found. With that being the case, terrestrial carbon sequestration is a win-win-win option. Next one. Thank you. Next one, please. Farming carbon, what it means? It means is creating another income stream for farmer, paying them for ecosystem services. That's what farming carbon means. The next one. And this is not necessarily, please next. Uh, this is not necessarily market driven price and demand which can sometimes crash to less than $1 per ton of CO2. The societal value of carbon is about $120 to $130 per ton of C, $35 per ton of CO2. Therefore, if farmers sequester half a ton per hectare of carbon, they must be compensated through somewhere $65 per hectare, $25 per acre, or for one third ton, $43 per hectare, or $18 per acre. European price, EU is about 25 to 30 per ton of CO2. That's fair, the next one. Next slide, please. So soil health and SDGs are also very important. Uh, keep going, please. Uh, such as goal number two, goal number three, 13 and 15, land degradation neutrality. Some other goal and poverty, good health and others are also very critical. So soil health, is essential, critical, to put back on the track the sustainable development goal. Unfortunately, they are not completely on the track to realization by 2030. Next one, please. Please, next one. I would like to promote the concept that uh, soil health is like a pyramid. The base of the pyramid is global soil resources and global car carbon stock, the next one. And on it depend the four sides of the pyramid. One is food security. The next one is uh, climate change adaptation mitigation. The next one is land degradation neutrality, very important to UNCD goal. And the next one, biodiversity. The four sides of this pyramid, which are ecosystem services, essentially sustainable development goal can only be achieved. The next one, please. Please click next. If there is a political will and prudent governance, political will and prudent governance is very critical. And to that respect, next one, please click. Uh, I would like to share with you toward the end, the message from Pope Francis in his, uh, and cyclic in 2015, and it's very pertinent because we are meeting in Rome. He said, ongoing research should also give us a better understanding of how different creatures, he's referring to biodiversity, relate to one another in making up the larger units, which today we call ecosystems. The last of the thing that I'd like to share from him, Pope Francis, let ours be a time remembered for the awakening of a new reverence for life, the firm resolve to achieve sustainability, the quickening of the struggle for justice and peace, and the joyful celebration of life. I think that message is very, very critical. Please, next one. And with that one, I wish you all a very, very happy um, the Earth Day, uh, which started in 1970 as a result of the oil spill in Bar Santa Barbara, California. And that killed 10,000 birds, seabirds, sea lions, seal, and many aquatic animals. And that created the movement of protection of biodiversity and looking after the Earth. Thank you for the invitation. All the best to you. Thank you very much, dear professor. It has been a very instructive presentation as always uh, on how if we, don't, if we do not protect soil health and soil biodiversity, 
we will not achieve the sustainable development goals to which the entire international community is committed. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now it is time to take a closer look at the role of biodiversity in agri-food system. And for this, we are pleased to have with us today the Secretary of the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture and the leader of FAO's Biodiversity Workstream, Dr. Irene Hoffman. Dear Dr. Hoffman, sorry, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Okay. You see my screen? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think we have a very nice build up from what Professor Lal has mentioned as the entering into the policy arena. And biodiversity mainstreaming is a topic that is very close to all of our hearts. We have seen in the many assessments recently that biodiversity is being lost and that not only threatens the biodiversity itself, but also the ecosystem services that human well-being depends upon. And food security, of course, is one of the very important ones that is close to the heart of FAO. In the opening of the, uh, this symposium, um, Eduardo Mansour showed this slide and it looks at soil and the ecosystem services it provides. And if we think of that from the biodiversity mainstreaming perspective, then the importance of biodiversity, in this specific case, soil biodiversity, has to be integrated in all the policies, actions, and, and other societal decisions and governance mechanisms that relate to these different sectors where these ecosystem services are finally um, ending up. For example, in climate regulation. And as Professor Lal said, this is a very important and increasingly important area because biodiversity and climate change are very closely related but also um, yeah, water purification and other types of habitats. So mainstreaming means that biodiversity is considered in all sectors of uh, policy making and practices that have an impact on this type of biodiversity. And that's where FAO comes into the game. FAO is the UN uh, specialized agency with a mandate to um, reduce food insecurity and hunger. But also since its beginning, it has been a neutral and open forum for our more than 194 member countries to discuss biodiversity related policies and also to come to agreements on these among the members. And over time, we now have over 90 instruments and mechanisms hosted by FAO, many of which refer to biodiversity. And um, there are, is the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, where I'm the secretary of, but also the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, the Global Soil Partnership, the International Plant Protection Convention, globally, important agricultural heritage systems, the Mountain Partnership, and many, many more. FAO's role extends in the 2030 agenda also as being custodian of the 21 Sustainable Development Goals indicators. And out of these 21, 14 relate to the Convention on Biological Diversities, Aichi Biodiversity Targets. And that shows how closely we are also supporting countries in the monitoring of biodiversity in different um, fields. And this cuts across all the sectors that FAO is covering, which is crop and livestock agriculture, fisheries, forestry, and aquaculture. 
And here you can see, this is just a little snapshot of the different reports, assessments, guidelines, tools that FAO is developing in the different sectors of biodiversity. And uh, coming back to biodiversity mainstreaming, conventional biological diversity has since the beginning um, identified mainstreaming as one of the areas where improvements on biodiversity can be made because um, the majority of biodiversity is managed not by the conservation community, but by other sectors. And this must be, the biodiversity must therefore be mainstreamed in the actions of these other sectors. And FAO, therefore in 2019, Adapt, adopted its own strategy on mainstreaming biodiversity across agricultural sectors, which is very closely linked to what um, the CBD is developing now as a long-term approach to mainstreaming. So this FAO strategy is an FAO in, uh, document. It's directed at FAO actions, but it aims to mainstream biodiversity across all the agricultural sectors at all levels, and to do that in a structured and coherent manner, taking into account all the national priorities, conditions, and so on in FAO's country programming framework, but also linking with other UN organizations, activities at national level. And the ultimate goal would be to reduce the negative impacts of agricultural practices on biodiversity by promoting sustainable agricultural practices and therefore to conserve and restore and enhance biodiversity as a whole. As I said, this is a strategy for FAO. It looks at better coordinating FAO's work within the house to improve the support that is provided to members on their request on capacity development and policies, but also to embed biodiversity squarely within FAO's policies, programs and practices, but also to make the critical role of biodiversity and its the, the ecosystem services that come from the food and agriculture sector and serve the food and agriculture sector internationally re recognized. And this work um, is, sits squarely into what the CBD is doing. And for example, the CBD as part of the mainstreaming has a program of work on agricultural biodiversity with cross-cutting initiatives. One is on soil biodiversity and one is on pollinators. And FAO is the agency that implements those um, initiatives. And the, um, this is where your work of the soil community comes in very importantly when this um, action plan on soil biodiversity will be finally approved by the CBD. And FAO is already implementing the national pollinator, international pollinator initiative. So you see the complementary between what the CBD does and what FAO then does and implements for the agricultural sectors. We also, like the other organizations, do assessments. And let me just highlight uh, here the 2019 State of the World's Biodiversity for Food and Agriculture, which looked at the um, all aspects of biodiversity within and around production system. And it put specific attention to the invisible parts of biodiversity, which we call associated biodiversity, which is soil, pollinators, pest and disease control organisms, and so on. So those that provide the ecosystem services without which agriculture cannot work. And it shouldn't be a surprise that also this assessment came to the conclusion that biodiversity for food and agriculture is declining all over the world. 
and there are many knowledge gaps and therefore we were happy that the state of knowledge of soil biodiversity has um, added knowledge to gaps on soil biodiversity, but there are many other knowledge gaps that need to be filled, but there are also many actions that have to be taken by different actors in different sectors to improve the status. And there are practices available that need to be more widely applied, as Professor Lal also said. Then there is policy processes going on. And for example, the commission has agreed that this state of the world report deserves a policy response. And there is currently a negotiation ongoing to develop what may become a global plan of action on biodiversity for food and agriculture. And you may watch this space. And there is otherwise a program of work of the commission on microbes and invertebrates, which will look at soil biodiversity. And there will also be um, discussions and we hope for a close synergy and collaboration with the soil community in that respect. So you see there are different streams of mainstreaming at different levels that, that go from assessments to policies to tools where um, what FAO does for the agricultural sector and what other sectors do should go hand in hand. And if you need more information on FAO's work on biodiversity mainstreaming, here are the web pages and also some overall brochures. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoffman. You have indeed grounded the work to be done by this organization and other partners to ensure sustainable and resilient agri-food systems. So thank you very much. I would like now to remind all participants that you can use the chat to post your, to post your questions so that the speakers can answer them directly because we will not have a Q&A session because due, due to the uh, time constraint. Now we have heard during these four days that soil health and human health go hand in hand, and that we must work towards the concept of one health, right? And our next speaker will explain why it is key to maintain soil biodiversity to address one of the greatest threats we face, and that puts the lives of millions of people at risk each year. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome Deputy Director of the Swedish Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation, who has also been a colleague of us here at FAO, Dr. Gunilla Eklund. Dear Gunilla, you have our full attention. Thank you so much for being with us. Natalia, thank you so much. And checking my sound, can you hear me? Yes, and perfectly, see my screen? and we can see your screen, yeah. That's perfect. Thank you so much and good afternoon from Stockholm in Sweden, where we have actually had a little snow this morning but happy Earth Day to all of you. And thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to raise awareness of AMR uh, as an emerging as pollutant in soil and also to highlight AMR's relationship with soil biodiversity. I'm Gunilla Eklund. I'm a veterinarian, a toxicologist, and as Natalia said, a former secondee to the FAO AMR working group. And uh, to set the scene and reminding ourselves what AMR is, AMR stands for antimicrobial resistance, and it is simply microbes fighting back against us or against medicines. It is bacteria, viruses, or other microbes mutated to survive the drugs that we give to cure disease in humans, in plants, and in animals. But um, there is also another kind of resistance. When plant pests are exposed to toxic chemicals like pesticides, they can become resistant too. But that is not what I'm addressing here, but rather resistant pathogens or resistance genes that are relevant to human or animal health. For example, bacteria resistant to um, penicillin. We must remember that AMR is a natural phenomenon. It can never be eradicated. 
but we need to keep it under control. And why is that? As Natalia said, this is uh, an emerging global health threat. And because a continued rise in AMR by 2050 is estimated to lead to 10 million deaths per year, that is more than cancer and a decrease of over 3% in GDP, gross domestic product. So let's have a look at what triggers the emergence of AMR. Antimicrobials, such as antibiotics, are used in human healthcare, plant production, and in animal health uh, to control for disease, which is illustrated here. And here they play a critical role. They ensure health, food safety, food security, and livelihoods. However, overuse or misuse of antimicrobials in all these sectors illustrated here, trigger emergence of AMR through selection pressure. Microbes may gain resistance through mutation or gene transfer. So soil can be contaminated through these activities uh, namely through application of manure on agricultural land, irrigation with untreated wastewater, or application of antibiotics as pesticides in plant production that select for resistance in soil bacteria. So the challenge illustrated here is really to try and control the tap on the slide and minimize the leakage or um, the emergence of AMR contamination of the environment, including in soil. There is also another challenge, and that is that the agriculture production really needs to grow to meet the needs of a growing population. So increasing food production sustainably with less antimicrobials is going to be very challenging. And one solution would be to reduce the need for antimicrobials in all these sectors illustrated here by preventing disease in the first place. So here it says that AMR is a global challenge and it requires global response. And I would also add uh, an intersectoral global response because AMR does not respect borders between countries, species or biotopes. And resistant pathogens like salmonella or genes or drug residues circulate like you see here in this circular picture between food, animals, people, into the environment, also into soil. So this slide really highlights that all these sectors need to engage together and develop solutions together on how to curb AMR. So what is known and what is needed? Well, we know that AMR as resistant pathogens, genes or drug residues is detected in soil and in food of plant origin. However, the impact on health from, from this is still unclear. So antibiotics are known also to adsorb to soil. And we know that release of antibiotics is possible if changes appear, for example, of um, pH in the soil. So soil is considered a possible favorable environment for emergence of AMR due to its high complexity and ongoing competition between the microorganisms in soil. Thus soil, as it said the first bullet here, uh, serve as a reservoir of AMR and can act as a source of resistance determinants that can spread to human pathogens and contaminate food of plant origin. That, that we know. But is soil a possible cradle for exchange of resistance genes between soil bacteria and pathogens from say manure application, or is soil an environment that dilutes the risks with AMR to health? What do we know about the relationship between soil biodiversity and AMR? I wish we knew more. There is a huge knowledge gap here on the impact of soil biodiversity on AMR and vice versa, AMR on soil biodiversity. The presence of antimicrobials in soil could prompt changes in biodiversity since resistant organisms quite often have evolutionary advantages. 
We know that biodiversity in soil is known to slow pesticide resistance and it protects plants from disease. So perhaps biodiversity is also protects from emergence of AMR. Microbial di diversity has been shown in studies to be negatively correlated with the abundance of resistance genes. This indicates that high microbial diversity can, can act as a barrier and resist the spread of antibiotic resistance. But as I said, there are huge knowledge gaps here. So try to identify what is needed. First of all, currently, there are no robust data on the volume of antimicrobials used as pesticides in plant production. But we know that at least 20 countries have registered antibiotics, like streptomycin, for example, to control for bacterial diseases, such as fire blight and citrus greening disease in plant production. Secondly, there is also lack of monitoring data on levels of AMR in soil, and I will get back to this shortly. And thirdly, standardized methods to detect and trace the fate of AMR in soil are also needed. What happens with the resistance genes uh, once it has reached the soil? So what is being done? Because that was a lot of question marks. Well, one must start by highlighting that AMR is being addressed by many stakeholders, including FAO and uh, WHO. And um, a blueprint, a starting point is the, um, in 2015, a global action plan to curb AMR was adopted by the WHO members. And from their initiatives and progress evolve. It's what you see to the left. And I think it's also clickable um, for if we are uh, sharing these presentations afterwards. The environment is within the scope of this global action plan. Soil is not mentioned specifically, and there are knowledge gaps, especially around AMR's impact on environmental health, that must be um, said. Moving to the right, uh, what is being done? Well, first of all, within the EU, I, I come from an EU country, um, there, is th there is no antibiotic approved as a pesticide. This is contrary to other countries. Uh, where streptomycin, casugamycin, and other antibiotics are used in rice, fruit, and vegetable production. There is, um, as I mentioned, there is a lack of monitoring data of AMR in soil. What's the, what's the condition, really? Um, we don't know so much, but uh, to the left, you see, I mentioned the Lucas survey. Uh, the EU Lucas soil survey LUCAS stands for Land Use and Coverage Area from uh, Frame Survey. It has sampled resistant genes in topsoil, and we are all very much excited to look and looking forward to the results which are expected in 2022 next year. So there are many stakeholders addressing AMR, like FAO and IPPC are among those stakeholders through fact sheets, such as the one you see to the left and, and other activities, um, these stakeholders keep raising awareness of AMR. But as mentioned, little is known about the fate of AMR in soil and tools are required to monitor AMR's movement. A clear methodology or standard operating procedure to trace AMR through soils does not, does not yet exist. But the paper you see to the right is a collaboration between FAO and IAEA exploring methodologies that can be used to detect and to trace the source and the transport of antimicrobials through soil. So, in short, a better understanding of AMR, how it moves from agriculture areas to the environment through soil, as a vector is very important. We need to grasp this knowledge if we are to develop guidance to managing AMR effectively in the environment and control the impact it has or it may have on health. And as a deeper understanding of the relationship between soil biodiversity and AMR in soil. That is another thing that we're just beginning to look into now. And 
Again, I thank the organizers for the opportunity to raise awareness of the phenomenon of AMR uh, as a, an emerging pollutant and as a possible um, threat to biodiversity. And with that, I think that was my last slide. So I thank you for the attention and over to you, Natalia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunilla, indeed. Uh, I think we have learned a lot today as I'm sure not many people were aware of the links of AMR and soil pollution and how soil organisms could, could help to fight against antimicrobial resistance. So indeed, thank you very much. I would like now to introduce a member of the Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soil. She's a senior researcher at the Colombian Agricultural Research Corporation, AgroSavia. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Marta Bolaños Benavides, who will tell us about the role of soil biodiversity on crop nutrition and disease management. Dear Marta, it's a pleasure to have you here and please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sorry, Marta, you are mute. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, every uh, time uh, that, um, thank you for the introduction and invitation to participate with the topic soil biodiversity potential for crop nutrition and disease. I will discuss the soil biodiversity and the Role of soil biodiversity to improve nutrition and help different crops. in different agriculture to perceive soils and management strategy for to sustain with conservation. Economic situation of soil biodiversity benefits and consideration. There are a great number of organisms in the soils that provide an important service to the humans um, by fertilizers, by and promoters, and um, Streptomyces penicillium, um, who is a main producer of antibiotics, and Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, food and alcoholic beverage. However, in the soils, um, there are pathogen phytoparasites um, that affect food security crops as um, rice, chrome, wheat, potatoes, and musaceas. And regarding uh, the, in order to optimize agronomic um, practice, we must, um, take advance in the biological balance between organisms and communities in order to increase biological controllers, update mechanisms of action, computation, antibiosis, symbiosis, synergies uh, that um, improve activity biological in the resource source. Um, this relation plants organisms improve efficient fertilization and um, improved productive capacity of soil and uh, improved ad adaptation of climate um, change and variability. Um, the topic two is biodiversity plant nutrition in disease management. According to the results of macrofaunina and disolis, it was uh, found that the R1 population is was um, higher, the ART population in the second cycle of production in plantain, and the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and ART compost is better treatment. Regarding the population um, nematodes in soil and um, plantain roots are um, under biofertilization, was uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi um, plus plantain rice compost is the better treatment. Um, allows decrease in population, population in, in roots 
and uh, increasing the population saprophytic nematodes. In these uh, same uh, crops, the, um, it's, it's reported that inoculation with the mycorrhizal fungi and a mixture effect reduce Dutch uh, nematodes. Okay. Um, Helicotilencus, Pratilencus, and, and Radophilus yeah, is the nematodes pathogenous in plant time. And um, in this case, uh, the mycorrhizae increase or more or that's a uh, 30% in roots uh, base weight. Um, regarding the management of phytopathogenic bacteria uh, was um, navit in the soil has been demonstrated how uh, some st strain of trichoderma um, and allow reducing symptoms causado this pathogen while allow um, Adelaide is the manifesting of disease symptoms and uh, increase root uh, development. In this emphasis, here the trichoderma has a beneficial effect um, great that, than that the other treatments uh, of commercial producers since in external antagonist. Um, the light the development and show it less severity this, um, of the disease and the favorite development of rats. In this case of the Phytoptera cinnamomy, pathogen that attacks avocado crop, the application of Trichoderma harsianum and organic cover basis of sugarcane bagage allow the reduction of propagulus in the soil and the severity um, of root rot of plants with the uh, control. In this study, in addition to evaluating the effect of bagage of the disease, the effect on biological activity um, was determined with the higher enzymatic activity of phosphatase, acid phosphatase in soils that did not receive chemical fungicides. In this way, the importance of bioorganic component in the nutrients, in the nutrients nutrition, excuse me, and health of agroecosystem is uh, once again highlighted. As I indicated of total activity, uh, micro, uh, microbial activity, soil deshidrogenase activity was used as a good parameter to um, measure the stability of organic matter. Significant statistical differences were found uh, for deep and management, uh, growth management, um, age of plant, uh, as flowering age and with agroecological management versus conventional management. Third topic in the suppressive soils as a management strategy for the disease causes for folk um, R40. The study offered important information on a wide range of biological control agents. The study um, both the nursery and file for the management of FOC R1 and FOC R14. The authors mentioned, the authors mentioned that the last four decades, uh, about um, 100, 82 papers um, have been advanced in which it has reported that file condition control fusarium of 18% um, by using pseudomonas, bacillus, and streptomyces. Um, the major variability is uh, present in FOG R14. The report the significance uh, in regards uh, in, in interaction, excuse me, 
interaction between pH and nitrogen dose, the higher uh, the pH of nitrogen, the more severity of disease comes in the according of the rise of fog. The, they report significant interaction between pH and nitrogen where pH about six um, lower the damage rate with um, medium doses of nitrogen. The topic four is economic evaluation on the economic benefits of soil biodiversity. Uh, the application of native micro rice show higher economic retribution debido due, due to the low costs um, of the input and higher yields compared to the traditional management by farmers. Um, the economic benefits found in final study are supported by the dry biodiversity or muscular mycorrhizae. In this case, in soils cultivated with guava in Colombia, some species present uh, in almost all the farms sample and other species, particular characteristics of the soils prefer. Consideration as sustainable agriculture practices such as biofertilization, bio decrease environmental contamination, and um, increase the native population of soy biota. The regulation of crops pathogens, larger crops of the, uh, if the balance between species in agroecosystems uh, maintain. The bioorganic component includes soil biodiversity is fundamental for the sustainable management of agroecosystems. Healthy uh, to um, achieve the sustainable development goals, uh, being sustainable and competitive is feasible with tight tools, methodologies, and receive results. Let's get to work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Marta. It has a been very illustrative presentation where we have seen the role of soil biodiversity on improving crop productivity and overall soil health. So thank you so much. And I'm sure you will continue your work as an ITPS member, enhancing the knowledge and filling the knowledge gaps on soil biodiversity. So thank you so much. We will now conclude our technical session with the last presenter. He's a researcher from the Department of Environmental Biology at Sapienza University of Rome, and a good colleague of us who has contributed to the Global Soil Partnership's work on soil pollution. So thank you very much for that. And it's a pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Andrea Cecchi, who works on micro-remediation of polluted soils. And today he will tell us more about the potentials and challenges of bioremediation. So, dear Andrea, thank you so much for being here. And is, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, and Natalia. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my presentation. Can you see this? And can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers to invite me for this presentation today. Um, I have divided this presentation in three main parts, in an introduction, the bioremediation, and present and future challenges. Soil contamination is one of the main threats in a, um, that affect uh, soil, global soil. Um, and human activities can release different kinds of uh, contaminants, including persistent organic pollutants, potentially toxic elements, that can enter the soil ecosystem and can cause uh, severe environmental and health problems. Mixtures of substances are generally common in these uh, cases, and they create complex interaction and synergies that can um, affect, can be, represent a risk for humans and for living organisms. Here, uh, uh, a vision, a global dimension of the problem. Uh, I have uh, reported here some data from different countries 
Um, and these are just numbers that might uh, underestimate the, uh, the problem of the soil contamination. Of course, soil are so important for uh, life on Earth, uh, as they provide uh, consistent services um, um, for human well-being and for living organisms. They are a key reservoir of global diversity. We cannot divide biodiversity from soil. They are uh, one thing. And soil biodiversity can help us to uh, meet the sustainable development goals of United Nations 2030 agenda. And here a picture that was previously illustrated before, in which I would like you to focus on uh, the water purification and soil contamination reduction, which is very important in this contest. Soil biodiversity can help um, in soil remediation in all these levels. In particular, uh, we know that there are different physical chemical methods, um, but often uh, they are not sustainable or they can impair soil functionality or they can create uh, um, uh, some uh, problems or, for example, they are not uh, so um, cheap. So, uh, but on contrary, bioremediation um, is a, a natural based solution that can help us to solve this problem. Thanks to the um, processes uh, of natural processes in soil or the uh, activities of certain microorganisms uh, and uh, other organisms in soil. In particular, bioremediation is an environmentally friendly, cost effective, and sustainable technology. It's relatively, it's relatively simple to use, it has a high public acceptance. We know a um, different uh, success story about the bioremediation. And uh, just to have uh, uh, one data, uh, more than 400 uh, uh, sites has been uh, cleaned up uh, in the USA. Um, just to, to say, mention one data. Um, but also we know a lot of uh, taxa belong to different group of organisms, including bacteria, fungi, plants, algae, invertebrates such as a earthworm that can have application uh, in soil remediation. But uh, microorganisms uh, play fundamental ecological and geological rules. Uh, just to mention some, uh, decomposition, soil formation and stabilization, recycling of elements. And they can also have a very important and strong selective or not selective enzymes that can be used for transformation of organic persistent pollutants uh, or by to mediate the transformation of potentially toxic elements in less toxic form, in less available form, they can um, accumulate um, this uh, species that can accumulate high concentration of potentially toxic elements that can recover for future use. And these uh, yeah, reported some uh, scheme about the different mechanisms that can be involved in these uh, processes. In uh, my experience, uh, uh, I have studied fungal species uh, that can mediate transformation in biomineralization, bioaccumulation of potentially toxic elements, but also they can transform pesticide and other uh, organic pollutants. It's important uh, uh, also the interaction between microorganisms uh, in uh, um, soil. And just to say, mention um, one example, uh, fungal transportation networks are so important as fungal hyphae can uh, be highways for bacterial dispersion or for the, um, can be pipelines for vacuolar transportation of nutrients and pollutants. Of course, the plants also play fundamental roles in bioremediation of uh, toxic elements, organic for xenobiotics. And uh, um, it's important their interaction with uh, microorganisms, including bacteria, uh, um, filamentous fungi, or uh, mycorrhizal fungi and endophytic uh, micro microorganisms. They can mediate different mechanisms um, and they can, for example, stimulate the um, microbial community or they can uh, extract elements and bioaccumulate them 
Um, and they can also be uh, this later recover as a by horse for future use. We know uh, several taxa that can be used as upper accumulators, and they can uh, they are divided in different uh, several families, including, for example, brassicaceae. Um, soil bioremediation can be achieved also by stimulating the uh, microbial community uh, by changing uh, different uh, parameters in soils, or by adding inoculating um, uh, microorganisms in a singularly or in consortia. We, uh, we call this uh, by augmentation. And here I have reported uh, a table in which uh, uh, there are some of the main remediation methodologies uh, that I, uh, of course, as all um, methodologies, they, they, there are lots of, there can be the, some limitation, in particular, environmentally conditioned, contamination, uh, chemical nature of, uh, uh, of contamination, and also um, ecological interaction between native microbial community and of microorganisms. Uh, and uh, the microorganisms use in bioremediation, especially if these are not native. Um, other limitation can rep be represented by the uh, uncompleted uh, transformation of organic pollutants or by, um, uh, for example, by the activation of them. And in some cases, uh, uh, bioremediation can require a long period of time uh, for the complete process. But we have also some solution. We can, um, for example, um, um, scientific research is doing a, a lot of uh, progress uh, in uh, finding solution. Uh, we can uh, um, uh, get new uh, technological uh, integrated and multidisciplinary approach uh, that coming from, for example, from omics application, from modeling of uh, environmental modeling, uh, we can discover new species, new strains, and uh, get new information from uh, genes that encode a spe specific process in a specific uh, mechanisms in soil. We can also get better understanding of metabolic cooperation among the microbial communities. And uh, uh, it's, it's also possible an integration about, uh, between uh, physical chemical and biological methodologies. For example, nanobioremediation that can bind nanotechnologies and bioremediation. Um, just to say an example, um, it's possible, for example, um, for fungal species, mediate uh, the bio uh, mineralization of uh, uh, some elements, some metals, toxic metals. Nano, uh, the nano minerals resulted uh, can be used to create a new high tech um, um, pro pro um, products, uh, for example, um, batteries. And we have to face new emerging pollutants, not just the old one um, that represent, are represented by um, new plastic uh, materials, um, um, pharmaceuticals, and other uh, chemicals. And of course, we have to change our view um, economical, uh, economically, politically, and social, and uh, try to uh, better focus on bioremediation application as a new, uh, as a um, very good method and sustainable method. In conclusion, bioremediation is a, a technology, sustainable, environmentally friendly, uh, is a cost effective, and can really um, mediate, remediate soil pollution. Um, this is a um, natural uh, solution uh, that, thanks to the activity of uh, organisms, can help in soil uh, decontamination. Of course, uh, we have a solution for uh, overcome, to overcome limitation in bioremediation and to face uh, future challenges uh, to protect soil functionality and biodiversity. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. There is, uh, well, it has been a great presentation and there is certainly a lot of work to be done to unlock the full potential of soil organism that can help us to remedy the damage that we have done to the planet. So thank you very much for bringing this important solution.
And with this presentation, bring us to the end of this first session. A big thank you to all of our keynote speakers for such an enlightening session. I invite you to remain with us and look at the chat because I see there have been many, many questions for you. So please try to address some of them. And also I invite you to stay with us to listen the next session that will present the main conclusions of these three previous uh, amazing days. So now uh, I'm pleased to hand over the moderation of the final session of the symposium to our colleague, Carida Canales. Uh, so dear Carida, over to you. Thank you so much to everyone. Dear Natalia, thank you, thank you very much, and thank you for these uh, excellent uh, presentations. Let me welcome again all our distinguished panelists and participants, uh, all of you who have been following this symposium uh, throughout this week. Um, this is the plenary session of uh, where we will be hearing uh, about the main outcomes and key findings of this uh, 2021 Global Symposium on Soil Biodiversity. So I think it's it's a really uh, it's a real honor to be here with you today, and particularly um, to hear uh, this uh, this session. My name is Caridad Canales. Um, I am a program officer at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and I will be moderating uh, this session where we will hear from three excellent uh, speakers, um, as uh, we said before, on the main messages and findings from each uh, of the themes of the symposium. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of, uh, uh, of a rundown of how the, the session will, will be held, each presentation will be around a bit over uh, 10, 13 minutes. And uh, I will just kindly remind our speakers to keep uh, to the time so, so we can have um, uh, so we can uh, uh, finish on time. Um, to all our participants, please do not uh, hesitate to write to our speakers directly using the private message uh, option uh, of the chat uh, in the box if, if needed. We, I can already see there's a lot of interaction and a lot of questions going on. But uh, now, without uh, further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. George uh, Brown, who will tell us about uh, theme one uh, of the symposium uh, on the state of knowledge on soil uh, biodiversity. Mr. Brown is a researcher uh, in Brapa Forestry and professor at the Federal University of Paraná, Brazil, with over 30 years uh, of experience working on discovering soil biodiversity and the role of soil macrofauna in ecosystem processes and services. Uh, particularly in agricultural and forestry systems, mostly in Latin America. And most recently, he um, as well uh, contributed to the FAO, FAO report on, on soil biodiversity. I'm happy to say as well that uh, he contributed to the, to the initiative on the conservation and sustainable use of soil biodiversity when it was, recent, when it was initially launched by the Convention on, on Biological Diversity. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brown. And please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Caridad. And I will now share my screen. And please let me know if you can see it. All right. Yes, we can see it. Great. So thank you, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues from all over the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It is my pleasure to be presenting to you today a synthesis of theme one, uh, together with uh, Cynthia Niva, my colleague at Embrapa, and the help of several colleagues from the FAO. We have decided to present to you here um, uh, some of the aspects related to latest discoveries on the taxonomic genetic diversity of soil organisms, some of the main benefits from soil biodiversity and their activity, the status uh, and trends of the world soil biodiversity in terms of threats and, and, and management practices, and this uh, aiming to strengthen the dialogue between the scientific community, policymakers, and the general public. But I'd like to go back and I thank Caridad for opening this and reminding us that much of this uh, work here at, at the FAO and even this, this conference is due to actually an initiative that began almost 20 years ago, uh, the International Initiative for the Conservation and Sustainable Use of Soil Biodiversity. It's a cross-cutting initiative of CBD that was established in 2002 at COP6. 
And that same year, we organized in Brazil at Embrapa Soybean, together with FAO, a workshop that set up uh, basically the framework for this initiative, which was then approved uh, a few years later, a few years later at COP8 in Brazil in 2006, and then uh, was recently actually evaluated and and uh, there was reviewed and the review presented at Substa last May in Montreal. And this provides uh, an updated uh, plan of action for the international initiative for the next few years. So in fact, we've come over the last 20 years a very long way with some really great publications, some great syntheses like the European Atlas, the Global Atlas, several books, and of course, the recently published um, synthesis and the state of knowledge of soil biodiversity in December of last year and the summary for policymakers. And for the last 10 years, the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative has also been very active in promoting publications, conferences, webinars, and, and, and several other activities um, worldwide. Uh, as scientists, we know that there are a lot of variables that we need to be studying and, and a lot of interactions happening at different scales um, above and below ground as we look at the different drivers that affect soil biodiversity and their contribution to ecosystems. And we know that we also have to evaluate those at, at all sorts of different scales. We, we know that at, at the local scale where we, at the farm field scale where we do much of our work, um, there's, it's quite easy to show the impact of, of, of the soil biota, nutrient cycling, uplake, plant growth, uh, pest suppression, organic matter man, um, uh, supplies and, and regulation and soil structure and, and, and water retention. And as we go up upscale to the farm level and to the landscape level, there's other uh, variables that need to be taken into consideration, particularly land use practices, management, and their impacts on species diversity and their activity. And at the landscape level where we measure the ecosystem services, the regional pools are gonna be important and particularly their adaptability and resistance and resilience to, to land use changes and to climate changes. So as we go, uh, Stop there. Uh, we 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 have had a lot of scientific progress uh, that has been at various levels um, technologically. Um, our ability to detect and measure and describe this biodiversity has has immensely improved with uh, next generation sequencing, the use of metagenomics, the study of micro microbiomes, eDNA. And as we look into um, gene expression, functional aspects related to uh, soil biodiversity, we can use the transcriptomics. We've seen a, a, a huge grain and gain in our computing power, machine learning, remote sensing tools, and the ability to crunch huge amounts of data with our new statistical tools and computers. And, and due to the lack many times of, 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 of taxonomic expertise, we've seen a, a, a wider and wider adoption of proxies of diversity. And these have been really useful uh, when, when taxonomists are not available. And as we, we go into to the beneficial economic aspects, aspects we've also seen huge um, um, gains in the, in the ability to measure uh, these ecosystem functions and the value of these services. And just I throw in here some figures of the billions of dollars of savings in nitrogen fertilizer by and to fixation with legumes and other crops. And we've seen some fantastic country syntheses, not just in the last three days, um, but uh, in the literature, we've seen uh, some global synthesis for some taxa and some great national and, and, and global initiatives uh, for the assessment and monitoring of soil biodiversity. And uh, just to show an example here of some recent publications, um, this, this global map showing the soil biodiversity in Europe uh, using six biological attributes and some proxies uh, from soil chemistry for soil function. And uh, one, of the, one of the great examples of, of, of good implemented networks that are working in the Netherlands uh, and, and a map just for that country based on 11 soil biological attributes. So we've seen some, some great uh, country syntheses and some regional syntheses like these and continental even and even global such as this one that shows that yes, we have a lot of data but sometimes this data is, is, is very skewed towards particular taxa, whereas some taxa like uh, mites, uh, which have very few uh, sampling sites worldwide and are extremely biodiverse, still have, uh, have to be much more 
studied so that we can adequately assess impacts of, of, of land use changes and the global biodiversity for, for these taxa. And we see that as we go into functions, uh, yes, uh, several functions have been measured, but again, once again, some have been prioritized over others. And the same goes for biomass. And we see that, uh, in fact, many times um, these sampling um, uh, sites overlap uh, for some of these variables, but sometimes they don't. And there's huge gaps that still need to be filled in. So there is still a lot to do, and not just in terms of geographic distribution of, of our sampling, but also taxonomic expertise and, and being able to name some of these uh, animals and some of these microbes, uh, particularly because uh, conservation strategies need names. You know, the, the red lists need names so that they can be uh, a adequately assessed and, and their conservation status, particularly if they're endangered, uh, can be uh, and actions can be taken. And was, therefore we need taxonomists. You know, these are endangered species, just like some of these organisms, taxonomists are also in danger of extinction many, in many cases where they're lacking in many countries and, and for many taxa. We've seen not enough monitoring programs so that we know what's happening over time. And uh, in fact, as I mentioned, we have had some progress, but not enough in terms of the economic valuation, the quantification of these ecosystem services. So much so that even the IPBES report had very little information on soil biodiversity. Uh, so we need uh, more integrative, collaborative, standardized, and comparable studies and results worldwide. And these will, will work basically with the with establishment of networks. And there are some networks out there, some of them quite uh, old, you know, in, um, over 20 years, like the Soil Macrofauna Network, and which has almost 9,000 sites uh, sampled for soil invertebrates worldwide. And uh, we just uh, sent in a publication recently, which reviews about half of these sites, showing uh, biodiversity of, of the uh, so invertebrates in different ecosystems. And there's some other networks that are out there like mycorrhizal networks, rhizobiology networks, the LUCAS, and many others, which I, I didn't have time to include here, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Uh, yet it's important that these networks start to evaluate using these standard methods, um, many variables, not just uh, for biodiversity, but for ecosystem services and functions. And this is an example of Soyobahn in this recently published paper by Carlos Geha and, 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 and collaborators in science showing Soyobahn, which is a great initiative, and we hope that this takes off. And yet they are also uh, running into some roadblocks particularly bureaucratic um, um, blockages to, to sending samples and, and organisms and soils uh, across uh, different country boundaries. So there definitely is some, some need for some, uh, some frameworks to help improve uh, international collaboration and um, sending of samples and, and organisms worldwide. I'd like to finish off uh, with some uh, highlights of the last three days. We've had uh, over 170 presentations, uh, some really wonderful results uh, being presented and some lots of uh, calls to action and challenges to all of us for the future. Uh, definitely, these are just highlights. Uh, I, I exhort all of you to go in and, and check the website and look into all the posters and presentations. They're all there. There's some really wonderful things in there. I'm just going to highlight five main themes, five main topics that we, we uh, chose from the, this, this theme one, uh, which have to do there again with the discovery of biodiversity. So we've had some great uh, presentations and posters showing uh, many new species of invertebrates, of microbes, in, in different countries uh, and, and some great syntheses for, for countries like just Georgia, Mexico, Colombia, Iran, and some regions in Italy and, and Spain and Argentina and Bulgaria and other countries. Some uh, understudied organisms, uh, particularly for instance, Anchitraeids uh, in, in the large number of new species in, in uh, South America and some ground nesting bees, you know, flying soil organisms, you know, they're, they spend a part of their time in the soil, yet they're flying around in, in part of their lifetime as well. So definitely a niche there for further study and how um, these animals contribute to ecosystem services and how we, uh, what we're doing uh, helps or hinders their populations. We've uh, seen some great examples of technological advances in measurements uh, and traditional indigenous knowledge. Um, we've seen some great results of the soil bio for, for Brazil, 
um, and using soil enzymes. Um, soil ions uh, and the chemical kinetics in Japan, um, great techniques such as eDNA and metabarcoding and ecoplates to look at microbial biodiversity and, and, and functional importance. And even um, some simulated dark earths, you know, Terra Preta Nova, ancient indigenous techniques and their improvement of soil fertility. We've seen some great uh, um, new techniques showing how to measure ecosystem fun functions and, and delivery of ecosystem services through the study of bioturbation, soil chromatography here with some great images that can be used to show uh, soil biodiversity farmers, uh, traits database, uh, Betsy, um, various tools such as the BioFunk tool, which uh, looks at, at various uh, variables and integrates biodiversity and ecosystem services effect, impacts. And of course, uh, lots of studies on soil microorganisms, you know, their beneficial aspects for co-inoculation, plant growth promoting bacteria, biofilms, biofertilizers, mycorrhizae fungi, nit nitrogen fixers, p solubilized bacteria, pests and disease control agents, and all of their, these agents and their importance in soil health. Um, we have some further examples of tools that QBSAR using soil arthropods in various countries in the world, using invertebrates and microbes as indicators of, of pesticide use or, or ecotoxicology and, and of land use changes, various scoring functions and, and, and statistical tools to look at microbial and invertebrates and soil properties and, and plant growth all in combination. And of course, uh, bioturbation, so halat hydrology and, and impacts on, on, on soil structure. And we've seen some great uh, initiatives over the last few years um, in, in such as the tea composition, looking at de decomposition using tea bags uh, with a network all over the world, several monitoring networks, uh, mainly in, in, in Europe. It'd be great to see some of those more in other countries. Uh, we have the Soil Health Initiative, for instance, in the United States, and a great citizen science uh, initiative in Switzerland showing the use of undergarments as, uh, as indicators for, for decomposition in soils. So there, we've seen a lot of things happening, a lot of great results, and yet um, still some considerable challenges for the future. And this, uh, I'd just like to show the end here with this slide showing uh, some of the, the, the issues that have to do with uh, theme two and theme three as we go into um, actually promoting the conservation, sustainable management and use of these soil biota. It's really important that they start to get integrated into red lists and these very underrepresented organisms are practically absent from these lists. And as we see uh, increasing use of urban, uh, urban soils and urban agriculture, organic agriculture and conservation agriculture across the world. There are several issues of how to incorporate soil biodiversity and the services of these animals and organisms, uh, microorganisms into these systems. And of course, uh, assessment of land use and climate change impacts on both soil biodiversity and ecosystem services. So I'd like to end there and, and, and uh, once again say thank you for your attention. Thank you FAO for this invitation, those colleagues who helped us the, in funding institutions and our own institutions for, for providing all their support. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, George. And, and it's, it is really um, for this really excellent presentation and for reminding us as well um, and, and uh, highlighting the importance that uh, there has been progress, but there are still gaps, especially around um, uh, taxonomic expertise and, and, and gaps geographically, but also the importance of networks and, and standardizing methods and really capturing these five, uh, these five themes um, where, where we can already see the, the emerging outcomes of, um, uh, of these discussions. And also the, the, the mentioning of, of the initiative on soil uh, biodiversities that will be discussed and, and, and hopefully adopted uh, by the, the next conference of the parties of uh, the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity. So now I would like to, to invite uh, Ms. Zoe Lindo, who is a tenure professor professor and faculty scholar of the Department of Biology at the University of Western uh, Ontario in Canada. Uh, Dr. Lindo's research uh, explores the links uh, between soil biodiversity and ecosystem level processes such as the composition and carbon storage and has uh, worked extensively in, in forested and peatland um, ecosystems to understand the impacts of uh, global environmental change in um, on soil systems. So uh, Zoe, um, Zoe's presentation will focus on theme two, 
Soil uh, Biodiversity in Action. And I hand over uh, to you, Soy. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, welcome, everybody. Just give me one second here. OK. So soils contain one quarter of the world's biodiversity, and they perform critical functions such as nutrient cycling and carbon storage. Um, however, soil systems are uh, being subjected to the stress of global environmental change, and indeed uh, the numerous threats that are impacting genetic, taxonomic, and functional diversity in many soil systems are causing non-random changes in carbon sequestration, uh, the provisioning of food, fiber, and fuel, and cascading biodiversity losses. Uh, there's no doubt that the consequences of ignoring soil biodiversity have caught up with us. So where do we go from here? Theme two aims to review the role and the application of soil biodiversity in the field and explore the effective methodologies, technologies, techniques, and practices that promote the conservation and sustainable use of soil biodiversity. In doing so, the presentations that are in theme two of this global symposium provide a way forward uh, to upscale those sustainable approaches such that we can improve by uh, productivity, accelerate biodiversity conservation and the sustainable use of its resources, as well as guarantee equitable participation in predictive landscapes. The presentations in theme two address several key questions and provide important information that will help us reach these goals. So the first question addresses understanding the main drivers of soil biodiversity loss and the ecosystem level consequences of loss. The second question, how do losses vary across environments? And the third, can loss of soil biodiversity be reversed? The main drivers of soil biodiversity are similar to the drivers of biodiversity loss in above ground systems. This includes intensive uh, and industrial agricultural practices and often subsequent conversion of agricultural lands to urbanization. There's intensive and industrial resource extraction. So for example, mining, but also forestry that can lead to the pollution of our soils. Less well known are the consequences of multiple climate change factors. But these industrial practices affect uh, soil biodiversity through physical, chemical, and biological mechanisms. And as such, the losses of soil biodiversity are somewhat predictable across different environments. Physical disturbance, for example, disrupts fungal networks. It alters soil pore spaces where the organism leads live, and this leads to changes in soil food web dynamics. Some of the predictable changes that we see across many different types of disturbances include um, fungal abundance and diversity tends to decrease. This shifts the microbial dominance towards bacterial communities. And we also know that slow growing, longer lived arthropods like orobatid mites tend to decrease in favor of faster reproducing species. As well, larger bodied arthropods and some of our topsoil predators tend to be lost. The absolute pattern of these losses, however, do depend on the physical and chemical soil variables, such as soil moisture, nutrient availability, and pH, just to name a few. And so the response of soil biodiversity can vary across different ecosystems. The big question, though, is whether and how soil biodiversity loss can be reversed. Land degradation encompasses many threats to soil biodiversity, and I think the action is clear avoid the drivers of loss where we can, reduce the drivers of loss where we can, and in doing so, we can start the process of reversing the loss of soil biodiversity. And so the question isn't, can we reverse these losses, but how can we reverse these losses? So several presentations spoke to uh, organic amendments, and these images here are from presentations by uh, Ortega and Kumar. Uh, and so, for instance, adding compost, manure, and other organic sources to soils that lack or are depleted in soil organic carbon helps to maintain moisture. It provides habitat and structure, as well as nutrients for soil biodiversity. Uh, at the same time, we can inoculate the soils directly with soil biodiversity. And this leads to our next core question. Given the prevalence of industrial intensive agricultural practices across most of the globe and the need for sustainable food security, how can soil biodiversity support the transformation of agricultural systems towards achieving sustainable intensification? 
Many of the presentations in the past two days spoke to this question, and they provide clear and scientific results that suggest the way forward. The link between soil biodiversity and the primary soil functions of carbon transformation, nutrient cycling, and soil structure that are required for plant productivity are clear. In our goals to reconcile high food yields that are associated with high intensity agriculture, with agricultural practices that protect and promote soil biodiversity, the recommendations are also clear. No or minimum till practices that minimize soil physical disturbance, inter and multi-cropping systems that provide more diverse food production and enhance plant soil biotic interactions and prevent soil erosion. There's also organic amendments that enhance soil carbon, help retain moisture and are reservoir for nutrients, as well as biological inoculants that act as biofertilizers. Cumulatively, studies across different levels of complexity, like the study that we saw by Bender et al, provide compelling evidence that soil biodiversity can directly support agricultural product production and environmental integrity. Given this, what are the most effective knowledge sharing and capacity building approaches to raise awareness on the better use of soil biodiversity into agricultural practices? Bender et al. suggests that effective communication strategies like the Soil Your Undies uh, Citizen Science Initiative are needed to successfully transfer scientific research results to stakeholders, such as policymakers, farmers, and the general population. In a presentation by uh, Yoshi and Sharma, they demonstrated how participatory learning actions and initiatives can reinvigorate more traditional practices and innovations that may actually be more cost effective as well as sustainable. But the successful use of scientific knowledge by farmers relies on transforming scientific findings into easy to understand information and readily available tools. Uh, I'll also add that open access to information and global data repositories alongside uh, accessible education programs are important components of this knowledge sharing. And together, these actions themselves may actually provide new opportunities for employment to people who span boundaries between science and policy, science and education, and science and industry. So moving to the next question, what are the current successful methodologies, techniques, technologies, and practices in place to promote soil biodiversity conservation? We have many tools for assessing soil biodiversity that can monitor and therefore promote conservation. The challenge may in fact be that we have too many options. Many different tools exist from uh, deep sequencing that can be expensive and generates large amounts of data to simpler, faster, more cost-effective tools such as enzyme assays and visual assessments for microbial biomass and their ratios. Uh, there's also the use of gene markers for specific functions such as carbon cycling and uh, uh, aggregation. And these are being used, for instance, by the USDA to examine uh, what was referred to as the ghost of soil man management past. At the same time, we still need appropriate species level bioindicators to observe and monitor how well the system is operating. Nematodes, soil arthropods, and earthworms are some of the common ones. We do need to use the appropriate methodologies for the system and the question that we're, being, that we're asking, as well as the appropriate statistical tools for the data. But with increased collaborations, open access databases, and global repositories, uh, this is making it easier every day. The second part of this question, however, is how can we upscale biodiversity-based solutions and other sustainable approaches? And similar to question two, for achieving sustainable and productive agriculture, soil biodiversity can accelerate or facilitate soil respiration in disturbed and contaminated areas. Uh, we had uh, several good talks exploring the effects of organic amendments, biological inoculants, and keystone fauna effects on mining disturbed sites, sites that were contaminated by heavy metals, and degraded pasture lands. So organic amendments such as biochar can enhance root growth for bioremediation in heavy metal contaminated sites, especially when they're inoculated with things like end-fixing bacteria. Biological inoculants and bioaugmentation can improve soil microbial biodiversity and revegetation, as well as soil stabilization. 
and co-introductions, particularly of na nav native mycorrhizal fungi and native plant species can also accelerate restoration. While the biological activity of fauna themselves contribute to soil structure through biogenic soil aggregates that can retain nutrients as well as carbon. That said, restoration takes time and we have to be prepared for some changes in the biological community to remain unrestored. My last two slides and questions today are relatively understudied, but nonetheless no important questions that we need to address in future studies. The first is how can soil biodiversity support the One Health approach? One Health is an approach that recognizes that the health of people is closely connected to our shared environment. One Health is closely uh, linked to the concepts of ecosystem services that are of course underpinned by biodiversity. Soil biodiversity has a direct impact on our health by boosting nutrient content of our food, protecting us from foodborne illnesses, and modulating our immune response. Definitely the provisioning of nutrient-rich plants and clean water for consumption is directly linked to the quality of the soil system and our ability to produce sustainable agricultural crops. And they support the sustainable development goals for no poverty, zero hunger, and clean water. So biodiversity also underpins many supporting and regulating ecosystem services like soil formation and the prevention of erosion, climate change mitigation through carbon sequestration and pest management. And this facilitates the sustainable cities and communities where access to clean air and water improves human health. But we also know that cultural ecosystem services, such as a sense of place or aesthetic relief or, or inspiration, as well as having good social relationships and security can reduce stress and improve human health. And finally, soils hold potential for combating antimicrobial resistance and fungicide, herbicide, insecticide resistance as well. And this brings me to my final slide in question regarding the complexities and interconnectedness of the soil. Given the complexities of soil systems, the high diversity and plethora of indirect effects among soil food web members, how do we deal with and best understand this complexity? There's much evidence to suggest that this complexity and interconnectedness is important for emerging ecosystem properties like stability and soil health that link to human health. Understanding this interconnectedness will also help us predict uh, what was referred to as the victories and defeats, um, as, uh, as Maria Brionis calls them, that are inherent in bioregulation. We also know that any single species may contribute to multiple ecosystem functions and that numerous species likely contribute to any given function. And this is the concept of multifunctionality. However, there's still relatively little published work on how soil organisms regulate fundamental ecosystem processes, functions, and services, despite this emerging evidence. Finally, how do we best address interactions among multiple environmental stressors? The recent work of Rillig et al. suggests that soil processes, properties, and communities are actually poorly predicted by examining single effect responses. And this is because we lack a holistic knowledge on the complex interactions, such as facilitations and indirect effects that occur in soils. That said, I'm delighted that the importance as well as the beauty and the complexity of soil biodiversity is being recognized and the incredible presentations presented at this symposium signal a groundswell that will shape government policy, provide sustainable methodologies, and does promise equitable participation in productive landscapes. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Soy. Thank you so much for this excellent presentation and this very structured um, way of taking us through from uh, the drivers of soil biodiversity and how to avoid reduce, but how to reverse uh, these drivers when, when there is no other uh, uh, option. And uh, all the way to, to the concept of the one health and, and the complexity, so soil biodiversity, and as you rightly put it, the beauty of these complexities and, and the importance as well for, for uh, sustainable intens uh, intensification of um, agricultural systems. So thank you so much for this excellent presentation. 
So um, uh, finally, and uh, last but not uh, least, it, it is an honor for me to introduce Mr. Rosa, Miss, uh, sorry, Rosa Pock, uh, who is chair of the Intergovernmental Technical Panel uh, on Soils of the FAO Global Soil Partnership. Um, Ms. Rosa Pock will uh, close this uh, session, this plenary, with a presentation on theme three, soil biodiversity shaping the future of food uh, systems. I think, uh, Rosa, if, if you allow me, you uh, there is, uh, needs little introduction, but I'm just gonna say a few lines about her impressive career and, and her background. She's an agricultural engineer and professor of soil science. Uh, at the University of Leiden and, and with extensive experience in, in areas such as soil genesis and micromorphology. She has been um, uh, chaired of the IUES uh, Commission and co-authored uh, the soil chapter of three climate uh, change reports of Catalonia amongst many, uh, many others. Uh, so uh, Rosa, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Caridad for giving me the, the floor. And uh, well, one advantage of uh, being the last one presenting today is that uh, many of the things I'm going to show and to present in my slides have already been said, but um, I hope I will be able to show them in the scope of uh, applying them to soil policy, which is in fact the theme of, uh, well, the, the subject of theme three. Um, Indeed, theme three in the original formulation of this symposium um, was set to discuss legislation policies, international frameworks, and financial mechanisms to mainstreaming soil biodiversity across government and society, reducing the direct pressures, and promoting sustainable use and improving the status of soil biodiversity. Um, so, uh, it's uh, the big gap between science and policy, and this is very difficult for us because uh, we are scientists and uh, 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 we uh, do not have the focus or the, or the power or the, sometimes we miss some aspects that, uh, that are uh, the difficulties to put our ideas and our uh, recommendations in practice. So, um, well, in fact, this graph has been already shown by George, but uh, I want to use it to illustrate that the, um, the policies applied to climate, agriculture, and forestry and nature conservation, yeah, the management of these sectors should be, uh, should be ruled by several indicators that are directly related to soils and to soil biodiversity indeed, yeah. And then you have here the essential biodiversity variables that should be used to measure these uh, indicators or to build these indicators. Um, in this uh, theme, uh, we have had 31 excellent oral pre presentations and 14 posters, but in fact, the posters uh, are a kind of cross-cutting um, uh, well, fall in the in the other in the other themes as well. And since uh, soil policy is, uh, as I said, a cross-cutting subject, um, I have used also ideas and uh, presentations of the other themes. A uh, few of them. Okay, then um, the core questions. Well, I, I have used several drawings and pictures uh, of the of the nice books. On the on the walls of the context uh, of the the children books, I think that they illustrate very well all the ideas I'm going to show. So the first core questions of a core question of this theme would be: What are the contributions of soil biodiversity to implement policies facing key sustainable challenges and to support countries to achieve the sustainable development goals and other global commitments? Well, in fact, the contributions are already already known, but in this symposium, the other contributions have shown indeed that um, soil biodiversity for food production uh, acts in three ways that have been illustrated already in previous talks. 
one part is improving fertility of soils, either by, uh, by making the nutrients more available or uh, improving plant resistance against water stress, or, uh, well, through the application of biofertilizers that improve also the fertility of soils. Then there is another aspect that is the uh, pathogen control, yeah? the use of soil biodiversity or the management of soil biodiversity to find uh, against pests. Also against uh, soil pollution, there have been several presentations dealing with uh, degradation of pesticides. And also very interesting presentations on, uh, for instance, the influence of uh, uh, wood biodiversity on soils on post-harvest quality of some of some products. Um, all this uh, has been uh, perfectly illustrated. So more or less the mechanisms and uh, the methods are known. So our challenge is how to use these uh, methodologies to convince the politicians and the decision makers to formulate policies to, uh, to, uh, to make these methods uh, being applied easily. Um, there has been several presentations also dealing with uh, the, um, the positive effect of uh, biofertilization and organic fertilization on soil biodiversity, as well as in general sustainable management practices that in general favor uh, uh, biodiversity. Um, and on the contrary, um, some uh, non-sustainable management practices as uh, general application of pesticides, intensive agriculture, changing land use, some land use changes that adversely affect soil biodiversity. And also uh, very interesting to show that uh, even after several years of having applied um, pesticides or having uh, degraded the soil, soil biota has memory and does not recover immediately. So the uh, recovering is uh, in some cases in the mid or long term. So these things have to be taken into account when uh, formulating policies. Um, well, and I wanted also to, to stress that this is not, uh, uh, in some cases, it, it, it is not as clear as that. So it depends also on, on the combination of practices and uh, some of these methods are site specific. Uh, so we need to know how the ecosystem works to recommend uh, some of these practices. Well, uh, the second question would be how to include these uh, practices and how to convince the politicians uh, to include uh, biodiversity in, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the policies, in, the set, in different sectors as uh, land ten, ten, uh, tenure or landscape management, or ecosystem rehabilitation, food security and nutrition, and also to involve smallholders and family farmers in the sectors of public health and forestry as well. Well, I wanted here to remember our first session, the first days, uh, on the keynotes of uh, several companies uh, that demonstrate that uh, some uh, biodiversity-friendly policies and uh, programs can be introduced. Uh, um, also, uh, there has been several, uh, several presentations uh, stressing the role of the social awareness on uh, soil and soil biodiversity promotion. So this is uh, difficult already in the field of soils, so even more in the field of soil biodiversity. 
Uh, so I think that it's a problem we all scientists are aware of, of how to include soils as a friendly concept uh, uh, to the society. So this is, I think, that uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, very high importance uh, and is a previous factor that we have to, to include in any, any, any formulation of policies. Um, it has been said also in previous talks, the important role that urban and peri-urban agriculture may uh, have in uh, promoting soil biodiversity. Um, uh, cities are not uh, special or good places, favorable places for soil biodiversity, but uh, given the advantages that urban and peri-urban agriculture has, have in other uh, social, uh, aspects, I think that it's very important to uh, include them, include biodiversity in this, in this field. Um, also, the importance of demonstration plots. Uh, uh, people um, understand what uh, people see. Uh, so if we demonstrate the effectiveness of uh, some of these uh, methods and practices, we have uh, halfway done. Um, participatory work, it's, uh, it's a must. Uh, so to have uh, social uh, approval and social acceptance, uh, you must include all the decision makers and the stakeholders in the, in the process of formulating them. Um, also, I will show some examples of how to use existing policies to introduce uh, biodiversity indices and uh, indicators. And also, uh, I will say also some. I will show also some examples of the need of uh, quality control for biofertilizers uh, and for some products that are not standardized and uh, without uh, without this. Uh, this standardization, it will be very difficult to introduce some practices into the policies. So what I'm going to do is I have ch uh, chosen uh, several of the presentations to illustrate these aspects. They are not the, uh, the best ones because I have seen, I have said that uh, all of them are good. Yeah, so you should not take them as the, um, uh, uh, thinking that the others are not good, but just to illustrate some of, uh, of these aspects. Well, um, in fact, I, I think that these presentations, this presentation of, on uh, biofertilizers in India by um, Ashok Patra and uh, two authors is the one that most comprehensively um, is showing one example of how um, biofertilization can be. Uh, uh, can be promoted uh, country-wide, so in the whole country, by, uh, by a combined strategy. Hmm. So um, the Indian government has introduced schemes to scale up the use of biofertilizers from the beginning, from the formulation of the biofertilizer itself, to uh, establishment of plots and to extension uh, to, uh, to farmers. Uh, and um, well, as uh, shortcomings or problems in introducing the, bio the biofertilizers, um, it was said uh, that awareness has to be even more increased uh, and that it is very important, as I said before, the quality control and the standardization of the process of making the biofertilizers and also of the, all the process after uh, making them. So uh, um, uh, focus research on improving the shelf life of the bioinoculants, uh, delivery storage and quality control uh, are needed. Another example would be the um, agroenvironmental policy for the protection of soil biodiversity in Cuba. In this case, um, this policy is in the frame of uh, the voluntary guidelines on soil sustainable management and uh, biodiversity was introduced 
uh, through uh, uh, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat analysis that allow to establish demonstration areas for soil, uh, water, and forest conservation, where these different parameters, including uh, some ecological and uh, uh, biological uh, variables, are tested. And also, as always, in these uh, formulations, the traditional knowledge and participatory uh, formulation and research here uh, was applied. And well, uh, this is one of the examples of uh, the use of uh, uh, urban and periurban agriculture for the promotion of uh, soil biodiversity in cities. Hmm. So, uh, promotion of soil biodiversity must be seen as uh, uh, another factor yeah, that can be used in front of the politicians yeah, besides other environmental benefits that these practices provide. Um, well, it has, it has been also mentioned before in the, in the previous theme, but uh, here I wanted to stress that this, this index of um, uh, this indicator based on counting and identifying microarthropods as a quality index for soils uh, has been um, introduced uh, or incorporated in the regional monitoring network funded by the um, Common Agricultural Policy of the European Union. So um, these uh, this, in, this biodiversity index can be introduced in an existing policy. I wanted also to stress that uh, nowadays in the European community with the, uh, the, Green, Deal, um, the Green Deal project, uh, it is being built. So now it is the moment to introduce uh, the indicators we want uh, in particular, uh, if it is possible, biological indicators to monitor the quality of the soils in Europe. So um, I don't think we have to wait that uh, these uh, indicators are asked for, but I think that we should be proactive and try to incorporate them uh, in, the, in the fora um, that are debating now in the building of, of the monitoring network and so on. Um, I also wanted to um, point out or to indicate this, this, um, this soil quality, this soil quality index that takes into account also ecological succession, uh, interaction mineral soil biota uh, through also an holistic approach. So these factors are also, have also have always to be together. Um, Two more examples, one of uh, this multi evaluation of agroecological practices, uh, including uh, the agronomic performance and farmer perception in Madagascar with, uh, uh, with uh, extensive uh, coverage of all the island, uh, setting different uh, soil uh, management practices and different areas. Uh, so um, uh, this kind of experiences, I think that they are very useful for uh, creating awareness and promoting uh, the application of the formulation of policies. And uh, well, I want to finish, I don't know if I have more, but I, I, I wanted to finish the examples with this, with this communication, with this uh, presentation on, on uh, perception of soil macrofauna in the agricultural field in Brazil. So it deals with the awareness of people about the value of uh, soil um, bioma. And it is very interesting to see that uh, the perception of the people is, uh, is mostly bad. So most of the macrofauna is perceived as, as best, not beneficial. And this perception this perception is even worse when uh, the, the, in the regions where the good practices are not applied widely. Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, the third core question of this of this theme was what are the economic incentive subsidies and financial mechanisms that could support soil biodiversity and sustainable production? Can, be, can they be realigned and how? The problem is that there are no presentations on these, on these aspects. I am sure that there are some experiences and some, uh, some cases in the world, but uh, they have not been shown here in this in this uh, symposium. Yeah, um, it is of course related to the first uh, to my first slide because so we are scientists, we are uh, or there are very few economists among us, yeah, or politicians, yeah. But um, for instance, the only example I have seen, I have mm, I have. Uh, uh, and that is related to this to this uh, third question would be the case of uh, the promotion of biofertilizers in India, where the government subsidizes the uh, the process of making the uh, of, of of making the biofertilizers, the network of labs to uh, ensure the quality control and also subsidies to the farmers that uh, apply. Uh, these biofertilizers. Um, yeah, as I said before, this is our challenge. Yeah? So uh, the, the conclusions, the conclusions, um, well, I also ch uh, uh, have chosen several of uh, several aspects that I find that are important to keep in mind as take home messages. One of them is that uh, comprehensive and holistic approaches through participatory strategies to increase awareness are needed when formulating actions to promote soil biodiversity. Uh, always uh, thinking the connection between soil health, plant health, and human health. So uh, we should not restrict the um, biodiversity or including or mainstreaming biodiversity of soils in agricultural or forestry policies, for instance, but we should look at other fields, uh, plant and human health, where bio, uh, soil biodiversity is important, and it has been demonstrated in this symposium. Another aspect that has been pointed out before also is the need of continued research in time and space. Yeah? Um, you have noticed, I suppose, that in the many maps of the world that we have been shown, uh, pointing some uh, experiences or networks or, uh, or monitoring uh, uh, plots, uh, there are some gaps. There are some geographical gaps. Yeah? In particular, I think that there is a big gap in Africa. There are in other places. But uh, I think that uh, without knowledge without research, it's impossible to formulate any 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 policy saying we are going here or there. If, uh, we don't know the status of and the dynamics of our systems. Uh, it will be very difficult to uh, to convince people to deal with them. Another uh, aspect is the need to evaluate the organic residues and biofertilizers in the frame of circular economy. So standardization and quality control is needed yeah, because um, uh, otherwise we cannot ensure what is the response of your soil and your system to this uh, product or this practice. Yeah? Some, uh, so some standardization is needed. Another message would be um, that we have seen that the, the introduction of biological indices in existing monitoring, reporting, and verification mechanisms in sustainable soil management in general is feasible and proved successful in some cases. So it is possible to include them as, um, as a quality index for our soils. Um, and uh, another one would be that uh, well, we need to formulate proposals of financial instruments to incentivize soil biodiversity protection and promotion. Yeah, this is maybe the big gap in the in the participation 
uh, or in this in this symposium that uh, we have seen that very few communications deal with this. Uh, so um, yeah, I think that uh, that's all. I wanted to take these occasions to thank all the organizers to the FAUSTAP that has been a wonderful organized meeting to all the participants for their very high quality presentations and research. And thank you all for your attention. That's all, Caridad. Yes, Rosa, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, excellent uh, presentation as well. You've taken us as well from the importance of, uh, of linking science and policy and then through very concrete examples from bio, uh, bio fertilizers in, in India, way all the way through urban and peri-urban gardens and to Brazil and the perceptions of soil macrofauna and then to, to this important uh, gap on, on financial instruments. So again, really capturing those uh, elements um, uh, of the discussions that, uh, that are coming through. And uh, with these uh, three uh, excellent uh, presentations, we are now wrapping up uh, these uh, sessions, dear participants. And I, I would just like to, to wrap up uh, again, thanking our, our, our speakers, um, thanking you for, for being so active in, in the chat. And uh, maybe just with very quick uh, three takeaways uh, from, from my part, um, uh, we have heard that the three main topics of, uh, of, um, uh, of the symposium and the first one I would say uh, we recognize that progress has been made and we've heard uh, about uh, the scientific discoveries that, uh, that have been presented already but gaps uh, still remain especially geographically. We've heard about the complexities of um, uh, and, and how these are important as well and, and, and important as well to recognize the linkages of uh, health of for the uh, for the ecosystems, but also health for for the for people and planet. Uh, and finally, again, the importance of how science can can inform policy. So thank you again, dear participants from uh, the the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. This uh, symposium and and the collaboration with AFAO is extremely important, and it is a real and concrete example as well of how science is, is informing policy. We're looking forward to discussing and to uh, the adoption of the new, uh, uh, in, uh, not new, but renewed initiative on, on the conservation and, and, uh, um, uh, and sustainable use of soil biodiversity. And we very much uh, look forward to continuing uh, this uh, collaboration. Um, I uh, thank uh, again the organizers uh, for, for having the, the CBD, the convention, and I hand over now uh, I can see uh, Ms. Uh, Semedo um, uh, in, in, in the screen. So thank you very much and uh, all the best for this uh, last uh, session of the symposium. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope that uh, you can hear me. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. My name is Eduardo Mansour. I'm the director of the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment here in FAO in Rome. Good morning for those on the East. Good afternoon for those in our time zone. Oh, good morning for those on the West. And good evening for those in the East of us. We are uh, arriving at the closing session of this symposia. So your excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome you in such a large number, uh, about 1,700 people on the Zoom, about, uh, we estimate, we don't have precise, but about 1,500 on the, on the web stream. So we had no days in this symposium since Monday with less than 3,000 attendants, very impressive. And uh, it's, it's overwhelming for us. Um, I am moderating this session. And uh, you know that we repeat it throughout the day, 22 April is the International Mother Earth Day, especially for those from South America like me. Uh, we know the importance we attribute to our Pachamama. 
And uh, this global, this feeling of the Pachamama today is global. So happy Mother Earth Day, everyone. Let's move then to the session of conclusion of this symposium, which is gonna be brief. Uh, we will have a, a, an artist presentation. We will have the conclusions presented by the secretary of the Global Soil Partnership, Dr. Ronald Vargas. And the closing remarks, we are very honored to have here with us, since a while already attending the session, Madame uh, Maria Elena Semedo, the Deputy Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations FA. So um, I'm also thrilled with the, the fact that we arrived to our fourth global symposium since uh, the approval of the, the state of the world soils, the launching of the document in 26, 2016, every year we organize one uh, symposium to deep dive in the, each one of the 10 major threats to soil health that have been identified in the, in the uh, state of world soils um, for food and agriculture. And in 2017, we had the Soil Organic Carbon Symposium. In the 2018, we had the soil pollution. In the 2019, we had the soil erosion. And we are planning to have the, 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 the soil biodiversity in 2020. Uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to delay it. But uh, this turned it into, we are here now. We are concluding it. And it turned it into a very special event. Because uh, you can't imagine how many emails we received uh, from, from all over the world, hundreds of mail of people very grateful for the digital format of the symposium. Because they said they could finally attend a global meeting without having to fight for getting money to travel. And this is remarkably positive. If we can look at least one aspect positive in this very tragic uh, pandemic that the world is living through, uh, there is this new reality, the new virtual reality that motivates us to, to, to move ahead. And we have learned a lot uh, through, throughout the, the, the day. I think all of you looking at what we have in hands now, the state of world biodiversity, soil biodiversity, a thick volume, but also all the information that we had here, we learned a lot. And uh, let's, let's start our closing session with uh, a refreshing video that uh, presents the work of an artist that's here with us, Suzette Busema from the Netherlands. Suzette will introduce us the mysterious and hidden world of mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal you say in English, right? Fungal network. The project is called a uh, super organism and was developed in collaboration with uh, Nadia Sudzilovskaya, a soil scientist and a professor at Hasselt University in Belgium and also Leiden University in the Netherlands. The PhD students participated, and I am as excited as you are to see the video of Suzanne and uh, uh, Nadia that will be shown to us. Please. Almost all plants on Earth live in collaboration with fungi that are connected to their roots. This collaboration is called mycorrhiza. The mycorrhizal fungal network is the largest living system that ever existed on Earth and plays a crucial role in ecosystems, carbon storage, as well as our very existence. Commonly described as the internet or the brain of the forest, almost all plants are connected through this below-ground fungal network. Often referred to as a form of communication, plants trade carbon with the fungal network improving access to nutrients, minerals, and water. More than half of the carbon processed by plants during photosynthesis passes through mycorrhiza and is stored in soil. This ancient symbiosis between plants and fungi is threatened by human activities, such as the use of fertilizers and pesticides, 
deforestation and change in land use. We cannot feel, see, nor hear the fungal network. It could even seem that it doesn't exist. While actually, it's important to humanity, as we cannot live without it. That is why I started this multimedia project, in which I make mycorrhiza tangible, visible, hearable and smellable. This project aims to connect us to this hidden network and stimulate empathy by exploring it using all our senses. Many, many thanks, Suzette Musema, for sharing with us your marvelous and unique work and experience. The link to the bio of the artist is also being shared by my colleagues in the chat. So do not hesitate to contact her through the chat or by email if you want more information about this beautiful video that has been presented to us. And now before passing to, to Ronald for the Ronald Vargas, the Secretary of the Global Soil Partnership for the, the, the impressive closure, you're gonna be impressed by the numbers that he's gonna show us. Uh, I have the privilege to announce the winners of the poster competition. We had a poster competition since Monday. The poster exhibition is available online on the symposium uh, website. It's open, it was open to public voting. I would like to ask my colleagues to put the link of the public voting online. The web page featured over 50 scientific posters presenting the latest research on soil biodiversity. And let us congratulate to all of the authors involved in creating these posters and filming their video presentations. And uh, according to the post, the symposium website, I'm honored to announce the five winners of the poster competition, which came by vote. And uh, the first one is biodiverse for arbuscular mycorrhiza, mycorrhiza and chemical properties in soils of the Colombian coffee zone. For, uh, it's from Marta Marina Bolaños, Benavides and others from Agrosavia and had uh, 1,085 votes. The second one is fungal community assembly in soils of different crops farming in North Argentina from Ontivero and others from Argentina, who received 817 votes. Comparison between soil biodiversity at the Rio da Garça and Ribeirão Arrependido, um, it's a preserved watershed, from Oswaldo Julio Visque Filho and other from Unicamp, the University of Campinas in Brazil, got 764 votes. And, and termite diversity of the Colombian Amazon soils from Clara Peña Venegas and others of the Instituto Amazonico de Investigaciones Científicas in Colombia got the fourth position with 530 volts. And the fifth position was the effect of fairy ring fungi on topsoils micromorphology in Pyrenean grasslands from Lourdes Salazar and others of the University of Leida in Spain. With, our, with a total of 293 votes. We got more than 8,000 votes. So very, very impressive, uh, this new system also that allowed us to have the voting for the posters. Congratulations to the authors. And my colleague, Isabel Verbeck, who will contact them for sending the prize, which consists of the, 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 the GSOB kit. The kit is composed of shoppers, soil-related publications and material, and the report of the state of world soil biodiversity in hard copy. So, it's very uh, symbolic, but we are very honored to, to have this system. And it's now time to move to the very last presentation of the symposium. Allow me to invite uh, Dr. Ronald Vargas, the secretary of the FAO Global Soil Partnership to present the conclusions of the symposium and what it will lead us to. Ronald, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone all the participants that are still there. So I will go straight to share with you the conclusions and the way forward of uh, this symposium. As you know, all the symposiums we organize are target oriented. It means that they don't end here. Instead, it is just the beginning. So Eduardo already mentioned, COVID really gave us a lot of headache because we had to postpone many times the symposium, but a problem always gives you an opportunity. And this virtual symposium 
which was the first time we organized it as such, was a very challenging, uh, let's say, effort, but I think it was worth because, well, we also contributed because we reduced the carbon footprint. Nobody had to travel, etc. It was far cheaper. And definitely it was very much inclusive because we could have 161 countries represented and look at the number of participants that were in every day. So we are really proud and happy that we had all of you really joining this symposium. And if we, uh, and if we see the regions that were represented, luckily all regions were there. And as compared to other symposiums, the trend of having people in Europe was less. And now you have almost all regions represented uh, at least three equally. So that's very important for us. Uh, talking about gender balance, you can see that in this topic particularly because in soil science is challenging, but in this one, we have great uh, balance between the two. And very importantly, we have a diverse participation, not only for research and academia because that's the main science behind, but as you can see, we had private sector, we have also farmer uh, representatives, we had NGOs, the UN and private sector. We need to work with them. We cannot ignore them. They are also doing, and we show that. So this is very important because we need to work together and try to address all the problems like that. We had many, uh, well, during the four days, we had always plenaries starting with good keynotes. I, we hope that you enjoy it. We try to got variety of topics and also people. And definitely it was dynamic, not as interactive maybe as it could be when you are present, but okay, we need to take the best of this opportunity. Uh, in total, we had eight hours of plenary sessions we have more than 250 scientific abstracts submitted that we had to, of course, uh, with a scientific committee, select all the, the most representative ones, posters, 24 hours of parallel sessions. And we have also tried to go beyond our soil science community because that's very important. We need to bring soil science to non-soil scientists. And we need to start from children and youth because they are the future. And that's why the launch of the children book is very important for us. And always trying to combine soils with art, uh, with art is a very important way of reaching the public and showing the beauty behind this natural resource. Something very important. We need to be in the news. We need to go beyond our circle because otherwise all the great work you do in terms of science is not used or is not really reaching the policy dimension. And that's why we always pay a lot of attention in trying to have a press release that then can trigger reaction but by main newspapers, journals, etc. And as you can see, there, there has been quite good coverage of this event, meaning that now people can understand what at least, or they heard what is soil biodiversity. But what are the findings and conclusions? Well, there have been excellent presentations before uh, me by the three teams, and I just try to, to get all of them together. So yes, there is notable progress on soil biodiversity, particularly in talk, when talking about soil science, and there has been a number of global, regional, and national initiatives that are uh, doing quite good work. Nowadays, we have greater computing power to process modeling, but we have machine learning, bio augmentation, artificial intelligence, etc. molecular tools to describe unknown biodiversity. We have the establishment of some processes for soil biodiversity growing awareness on the uh, value of ecosystem services provided by soils and soil biodiversity, multiple stakes stakeholders trying to address this issue, not only academia and the UN, et cetera, and every government, but also private sector, as you could witness. We have seen also new approaches like syntropic farming, sinoculture, in which that are aimed to reduce agrochemical inputs. And 
Overall, very importantly, the recognition that soil is alive. That's why we talk about soil health. And this is especially important today that we celebrate International Day of Mother Earth Pachamama because that's exactly why it is alive. But still there are gaps and challenges and we should be uh, clear that soil biodiversity needs to be recognized on the sustainable development agendas, including the post-2020 biodiversity agenda. And there, there is a very important topic that we need to address, targets and indicators. And I know that for soil scientists, that is painful. Soil biodiversity should move from research to full application, and not only in agriculture, in all sectors. And we need to scale up investment. Most biota remains unknown and unnamed. And there has been some suggestions why we don't have a list of red species in terms of soil biodiversity. Lack of soil biodiversity data and information, especially in some regions, there is a geographic imbalance, standard protocols for data collection. Soil information systems and soil surveys do not really include fully soil biodiversity. We need to enhance capacities, human capacities, in, in many countries around the world, especially new methods, technologies, tools, in order to uh, move forward together. And a particular case was the taxonomy. Incentives or payments for ecosystem serv services provided by soil should be recognized and established, and we should really advocate for that. Ecosystem restoration should include soil biodiversity and soil health because it's where we start. Bioremediation should be scale, scale up because now we are facing with a lot of soil pollution. We need to invest on research, especially in soil borne diseases because the solution is there. You saw that we have bad and good organisms there. So the solution is there and we need to scale it up to all the agricultural sector. And of course, we're talking about climate change. We talk about soil health, but that should be so extreme in this one health approach a soil, plant, environment, and human health cannot be separated. And we should not forget the issue of microbiome and AMIR. When we say soil biodiversity is scarce, I give you an example. We have the guidelines for soil description. And in there, and that's from FAO, and it's used widely. When we go to biological activity, you will see that we count roots and maybe if there are earthworms and ants. Do you think that's enough? to talk about all the biodiversity that we have been talking all these four days. And also when we have soil, soil information systems, global or national ones, is soil biodiversity included? That's not really the case. So we really need to fill that gap. In the Global Soil Laboratory Network that we have with more than 680 soil laboratories, you can see how much of the laboratories from these laboratories in 50, 150 countries perform soil bio biological analysis, very few. And we want to populate soil biodiversity data. Are we ready? What do we need to do for really breaking this gap? I know that when we talk about indicators, it's always a challenge, but you know, we face this in our case because we have established a, a protocol in order to, to to see the compliance of the voluntary guidance for sustainable soil management. And with countries, we have been trying to negotiate for three, three years, which are the indicators. And you can see there the recommended set of indicators. And luckily there we have soil bio biological activity, respiration rate. However, the discussion is still with scientists is huge because not all agree that respiration rate represents really soil biological activity, et cetera. So it's a non-ending discussion. But then we have an opportunity because currently the, there is a global biodiversity framework post 2020 that the Convention on Biological Diversity and its members is discussing. And we have tried to advocate for including soil biodiversity and they tell us, okay, what are the targets and indicators you want to include? And that's where we, we, we get with the bottleneck. So what is our uh, key message here? In soil science, in soil biodiversity, I know we always try to get the best, but sometimes we need to compromise because we can lose a huge opportunity and then soil biodiversity will be always 
in this framework of organizing meetings, science, etc., but not having an opportunity for action. And that should be really something we need to take into account. We, I heard a lot about this, how to bring science into policy. So we have been developing a sort of soft normative tools like the voluntary guidelines for sustainable soil management, the con code of conduct for the sustainable use and management of fertilizers. What is the compliance with this? It's not mandatory, but we are trying to advocate and we know that this is happening slowly, but it is. So we should be really trying to associate this and we need to integrate. Very soon we will be launching the global assessment of soil pollution. So soil biodiversity, soil pollution and all should be integrated because at the end we need to manage the following an uh, integrated approach. And we should not leave uh, governance and legislation behind. What is the concrete way forward out of this symposium? Well, first of all, we need to see that we are not trying to address because we are the food and agriculture organization, we are not only focusing on food security and food safety, but as you can see, soil biodiversity offers us many potentialities and we want to address them all, okay? And this week has been the case because you have seen all type of cases and applications. Where to start? Well, we don't start from zero. There is a lot of happenings already in terms in term of institutional frameworking and you have heard about some of this. We started with the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas. We have an initiative. We have Soil Bond. We produce the state of knowledge of soil biodiversity. The countries are discussing the new biodiversity framework. And we have this international initiative for the conservation and sustainable use of soil biodiversity. Okay, So that's our framework. And we need to uh, really harvest it. What are concrete steps? We will continue advocating and raising awareness of the importance of soil biodiversity at all levels. We together will prepare the outcome document, keep soil alive, protect soil biodiversity. And this is really like our way forward. In that document, we will have the actions that need to be implemented, but together, otherwise it will not work. We will prepare proceedings of this symposium and then we need to join forces to execute the implementation plan of the International Initiative for the Conservation and Sustainable Use of Soil Biodiversity that hopefully will be endorsed by countries during the upcoming COP that will be held in China. That will help us also to mobilize resources because we need to enhance investment on this. Then we need to establish a Global Soil Biodiversity Observatory because we have been talking about need for having harmonization in terms of protocols for measuring, for mapping, etc., but also for monitoring. So we need such an observatory and we need to have you, all of you, we have how many scientists, people, practitioners, etc. We want to continue working with you and for that we would like to establish this technical network on soil biodiversity and it doesn't mean that we will avoid or we will forget all the work that is, it, it, it has been done so far. No, it doesn't mean this. So we, our core objective is to execute that implementation plan of this international initiative because it will be endorsed by all countries in the CBD and the outcome document that we will finalize together. By implementing these two, by establishing these two arms, the observatory and the network, we will be able to have all colleagues, not only scientists, but also private sector, civil society, NGOs coming together in order to execute and implement these activities. And we will start from all the work that we have been witnessing all this week. So we will start from zero and we will not forget anyone. So we really invite you to join us in all this because we want to make a change. Many of you have been saying that in the chat. So the opportunity is here. I hope we will count with you. And with this, I, I come to the end of my presentation and I want to thank you all for your active participation, all the speakers, but also my colleague in the secretariat who have been working very hard to make this happen. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ronald, and a big round of uh... Applause, a virtual applause to you.
for and to the Global Soil Partnership colleagues, also for our partners in CBD, in the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, in the UNCCD, SPI, uh, uh, all those who contributed to, to make sure that the symposium reached this level. And now, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, colleagues, it's my honor to invite Madame Maria Elena Semedo, the Deputy Director General of FAO, for the closing remarks of the Global Symposium on Soil Biodiversity. Madame Semedo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Good morning, good afternoon, bonjour, bonsoir, buenos dias, buenas tardes, excellencies, distinguished guests, dear participants, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to greet you at the closer of this symposium. We have reached the end of this marathon, as um, Vargas has said, Eduardo, all the other presenters, including the last plenary, which set out the way forward beyond the global symposium on soil biodiversity. Today, as it has already been said, we celebrate International Day of Mother Earth, a strong global call to protect our planet. This means we must protect our soil from degradation, which begins with sustainably managing our soil biodiversity. Our symposium, originally scheduled for March 2020, was postponed several times, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we managed to adapt to a new reality. And even if this format does not allow us as much informal exchange as face-to-face -face events, it has allowed an impressive number of participants. Over 5,000 people have connected in this four-day event. And as it has also been said, is the positive side of the virtual format. It provides better geographic participation, gender balance, and a multi-stakeholder biodiversity. Indeed, this webinar has made so many connections possible and expanded, I am sure, even more, the soil community and its outreach. I would like to recognize all the hard work undertaken by the Global Soil Partnership team and its intergovernment technical panel on soil, who have been closely collaborating with the CBD, the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, and the Science Policy Interface of the NCCD to make this meeting a great success. I would also like to thank our donors, the European Commission, the Russian Federation, Switzerland, as well as the Netherlands, thanks to all of you. Finally, I would like to thank all the keynote speakers, the panelists, the moderators, the authors, the artists who brought a special touch to the event, linking art to science, FAO colleagues. Maybe allow me to send a big thank you to Ronald Varas, Vargas, and I know Coming from a very difficult situation, he was able to successfully manage this symposium. And all the presenters for their engaging intervention that made for dynamic exchange. The team's chair have presented the main key messages and conclusion that have come out of productive discussion over the last three days. Nevertheless, let us keep in mind that this symposium is just the first step of many collaborative actions to tackle soil biodiversity loss. The recently launched report, State of Knowledge of Soil Biodiversity, highlighted the challenge and potential solutions. But this symposium truly provided a clear framework on the way forward. The World Soil Day 2020, the Soil Biodiversity Report, and now this symposium have raised awareness on soil biodiversity, which I am convinced will trigger action needed 
to prevent long-term soil biodiversity loss. It is clear that when discussing the post-2020 global biodiversity framework to be adopted at the upcoming biodiversity conference, COP15, we will advocate for including soil biodiversity as a key component that provides multiple benefits to its cross-cutting nature. Indeed, COP15 represents a crucial platform where we can present all the outcomes of this symposium and seek support for addressing the gaps that were clearly identified. We need to move to action. During this symposium, we manage to examine the current scientific and traditional knowledge on the role of soil biodiversity on food production, human health. And it was also said that we need to link plant, animal, and human health, and on sustaining biodiversity above ground. Identify knowledge gaps and explore opportunities for collaborative research, capacity building, and technical cooperation. Identify limitations and opportunities to promote the sustainable use of soil biodiversity. Present effective and replicable methodologies, technologies, and practices that promote sustainability and identify policy options to protect soil biodiversity and encourage the adoption of practices that enhance it. It was evident from different case studies that the sustainable use of soil biodiversity could really help us address the different challenge we have in food production, in environmental protection, climate, human health, and achieve the sustainable development goals and other global commitments. We need to scale up. All your work will feed the outcome document, keep soil alive, protect soil biodiversity, which will highlight the importance of addressing soil biodiversity loss from the food safety, environment, and human health perspectives, and will include a joint agenda for action based on scientific evidence to prevent and mitigate soil biodiversity loss. I hope we can count on all of you to implement this ambitious way forward. The first step is prioritizing soil biodiversity. To, the first step in prioritizing soil biodiversity is to develop standards, protocols, and procedures for assessing soil biodiversity and monitoring its change over time. At FAO, we are committed to putting healthy soils on the global agenda, improve awareness on soil, and support the countries to implement the appropriate policies. This is why FAO members establish and continue to support the Global Soil Partnership. The world needs innovative and effective solutions to prevent and address the threatening consequences of soil biodiversity loss. I hope the youth who attended the symposium will help us to identify new and effective solutions. We are committed to revamp the international initiative for the conservation and sustainable use of soil biodiversity, as this provides the intergovernmental framework to tackle soil biodiversity loss. Once again, Thank you all for participation in the discussion over these three last four days. You will soon receive information on the next step. And I hope we can continue the discussion on the financial instruments to support biodiversity and sustainable production. As it has been said, it, it, it's a miss from the discussion. Only by working together we can prevent soil biodiversity loss 
and foster healthy soils for all through sustainable soil management. Again, happy International Mother Day and thank you for being here with us during these four days. Thank you all and keep safe and healthy. Thank you, Eduardo, over to you. Thank you so much, Madam Semedo. Also a big round of applause for you, for your inspiring words, which will certainly, we will make sure that it's part, we will be part of the proceedings of the symposium because they provide the guidance, the inspiration that all of us need to move ahead with the implementation of, as you put so well, ambitious challenge ahead of us. Uh, on behalf of the organizers, I would like to present our humble thank you for the wonderful message of appreciation that we received through the chat that we are receiving from all over the world, from East West countries, from colleagues that we make this knowledge and uh, this information that we shared here available. We are very humble with your participation. And uh, I think we all leave the symposium with the feeling that we know more about soil biodiversity and we have uh, steps ahead, all of us to fulfill. So let's um, keep soil alive. Let's protect soil biodiversity. I thank you very much. The symposium is now closed. I wish you all the best in your endeavors. Thank you.